brand ambassador for the Maryland University of Integrative Health, also known as MUIH. And today we're talking about a great topic, three approaches to boost your immunity this winter. So as temperatures turn colder and we all start to congregate indoors with family and friends for the holidays, strategies to stay healthy become even more important. Boosting our immunity is a powerful way to take charge of our health and illness. Today, we'll hear from three different yet related perspectives on health, herbal medicine, Ayurveda, and nutrition. Here to show us how to enjoy optimal health this winter are Cheryl Van Lair, Sarah Rudman, and Sean Rose from MUIH, the Maryland University of Integrative Health. Welcome everyone and thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. So I just wanted to remind everybody watching, you know, there's a comment section and you can just feel free to comment and we will actually respond to your questions live. So it's a great opportunity. If you're looking for extra ways to boost your immunity, just stay with us today and take advantage of the wealth that these professionals have to share with us. So let's start with an overview of each of your perspectives in your fields on health and wellness this winter. Um, Sarah Jean, tell us what we need to know about Ayurveda. Sure. The Ayurvedic approach to wellness is becoming the, or recognizing yourself as the microcosm of the macrocosm. So it's a five elemental approach to wellness, indigenous to India. And we really look at qualitative wellness versus quantitative wellness, where in a more biomedical conventional approach, you might see measurements um, such as lab biomarkers and things like that. In Ayurveda, we're actually looking at qualities. And so we treat with opposite and like increases like. We're thinking about the winter right now. The qualities in the winter are ruled by the elements of air and ether or something called a dosha of vata. There are three constitutional doshas in Ayurveda that make up everything. I won't get into that right now because we don't have all that much time. So air and ether have the qualities of cold, rough, mobile, dry, subtle, and light. Mm -hmm. And so we would do diet and lifestyle interventions or daily routines that would have the opposite qualities, such as warmth, stable, um, smooth or oily, and... Uh, Fascinating. You know, I want to let everybody know, we're talking with Sarah Jean Rudman. She's adjunct faculty in Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic Wellness at UIH, um, as well as nutrition. And you mentioned the a word, uh, Sarah Jean, terms that people might not be familiar with. Uh, you said it's the macrocosm of the microcosm. Explain to us a little bit more about that because that was a great catchphrase, but I want to make sure everybody understands it. Sure. Other way around, though, we're the microcosm of the macrocosm. So if we're looking at everything in nature, the sun rises and sets in the sky, just like it rises and sets in our body. Um, we change with every season, with every moment, with every time of day, with every time of life where um, a different kind of more quantitative approach might have an N equals everybody approach and mm -hmm. an N equals everything kind of approach. So we have protocols. You need to eat this many calories every day, no matter what. You need to take this many macros and micros every day, no matter what. Where Ayurveda recognizes that mother nature is giving us everything that we need to get well. I mentioned that the winter is cold and dry and rough. Right. What are the foods that are available naturally in the winter? Root vegetables, grains, meats, dairy, so those sorts of things that are warming, more heavy, uh, more oily, those are going to be the things that balance the quality of nature. So as the sun rises in the day, for example, we need to eat our biggest meal when the sun is the highest and the hottest because our digestion is the highest and the hottest. Our smallest meal early in the evening before the sun goes all the way down because that's when our digestion is cooling down the most. We go to bed with the sun, we rise with the sun, that kind of thing. That's wonderful. And you know, what are, and speaking about those different methods and just the philosophy itself is inspiring and it, it's a, it's such a great idea. How do you think people nowadays in, in their busy lifestyle, for example, the sun being its hottest, I'm guessing uh, this time of year, maybe around 10 or 11 in the morning, something like that. I, I could be a little bit wrong, but during the winter time um, and getting these meals and say somebody's working in an office type setting or one of, one of those things. What are some ways that people could literally take with them these concepts and do them do them on the run? 
yeah, do the best that you can. Essentially, aim for midday. It doesn't need to be really great um, and dogmatic. In fact, that's going to work in the opposite way that you want it to if you stress out about doing every little thing. Sure. And so some ways that you could do the kind of gauging of the circadian rhythms that Ayurveda invites you to do in this modern world that wants to pull us away from nature in every possible way um, right. could be, you know, making your meals a ritual. This is advice that I give people all the time, um, whether they're going through a rough time in general in their life or if they're just working during the day and they need to eat their meals at work, make your meals a ritual. Make them something that is honoring nature. You're honoring the food. You're honoring it, entering your body, and you're doing the best you can. So just making sure you get that biggest meal midday and you don't sit in front of your computer and eat it or you no. don't eat it driving in your car and you let that be your most nourishing meal of the day to get you through is good enough. That's a great one. Yeah, one of my favorite teachers, uh, Dr. John Dulyard, he's uh, the owner of LifeSpa.com. He's awesome, super cool guy. He always says do 51% and then you're doing 1% better than half. And that really stuck with me my whole life. <laughs> I love it, right? And it takes the pressure off. That's a great tip. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sean, what about herbal medicine? Tell us some of your tips. Hello. Um, <clears throat> so herbal medicine definitely has a view well, first of all, I should say for every herbalist, there's a different view of herbal medicine. I'm pretty sure you'll you'll hear that. Um, but the way that I view things is actually pretty similar to what uh, Sarah Jean just said. Um, we, we follow an energetic model of diagnosis, so we don't use disease names. We don't use any of that sort of medical stuff. Most of the time we're talking about energetic qualities. So, um, I like to describe it and many herbalists like to describe it talking about the body's weather, what's the climate like and the weather inside or outside of your body will be the same as what you see out your window. Um, so basically we're thinking about winter. We would see it also as cold and dry. Um, if it's the element of earth uh, in Chinese medicine, I know they use the element of water to represent um, winter. Um, so what we're trying to do is kind of counteract the coldness and the dryness of winter, uh, by improving circulation in the body, boosting metabolism, um, and effectively just trying to stay warm and keep, uh, the liquid flowing in the body. If you think about winter time, that's when all the water is locked up into ice. Um, it's not a bit, you know. Here in Maryland, it's typically very humid in the summer, but in the winter, super dry. Um, so largely with our herbs, lifestyle adjustments, dietary adjustments that we would give you as clinical herbalists, you are actively countering the coldness and countering the dryness. And that's kind of the way that we look at immune health in the winter. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Cheryl, what about nutrition? I'm sure that you're going to piggyback right off of Sean because he was kind of leading us in there with some tips that set us up in the perfect space to talk about nutrition. Yeah, and also um, picking back on what Sarah Jean said, I think it's really important to just do your best. And your best is going to be different every day depending on how you're feeling, the demands of life and things like that. So, you know, a phrase I have on my wall is let food be like medicine. Um, and I think that's one of the things I love about the field of nutrition is just how powerful food is in terms of providing our body the resources it needed, needs, but also the information that affects mm -hmm. how it functions. So as an integrative nutritionist, we're not only looking at food, but we're looking at lifestyle and stress and environment. Um, we're very focused on whole person care. Mm -hmm. So there are some, you know, there's bodies of evidence that talk about nutrition and but we also want to make sure that we're personalizing something that's appropriate and optimal for the person that's in front of us. So, right. um, you know, kale's not great for everybody. It's good for most people, but there are times when kale's actually, you know, not the right food. So we're looking for balance. We're looking for things that are sustainable so that people can actually do them. Mm -hmm. um, and to be you know, kind of also, you know, what Sarah Jean mentioned about making your nourishment, a ritual. And 
and um, you know, sitting down and taking the time to to eat mindfully and you know to step away from your computer or not you know not eat in the car as much as you can. There are going to be times when the only time you can grab something nourishing is as you're racing between driving your kids all over the place. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so again, we're just trying to use food to support the immune system. If the nutrients that are involved in immune health, I mean, it's pretty much all of them. Um, right. You know, it's fascinating, Cheryl. And one of the things, you know, you mentioned that quote by Hippocrates when you started out and talking about food being medicine. And this is something that's been done for millennia. It's nothing new, right? But I think your new challenge for someone in your profession right now, as you mentioned, were lifestyle and stress because the types of lifestyle that we have and the types of stress that we have are very different than what people were dealing with thousands of years ago. And Oftentimes that gets left out of a lot of other nutrition topics. You know, you hear people just kind of pushing diets out because this is good without ever taking into consideration people's lifestyle and their stress levels. So talk to us a little bit specifically about that. And, you know, this time of year, with the different stresses that we have, the different things that are going on, how, how does that play into, into nutrition? That's such a great question and thank you. Um, I, I like to talk about stress resilience versus like stress reduction or stress management because if you have someone who's extraordinarily stressed by what life is demanding of them, asking them to reduce their stress isn't necessarily gonna be effective or you know in some ways kind. So sure. um, having people just be able to slow down a little bit and you know even if it's just breakfast that's eaten slowly or something along those lines, you know, as, as they're nourishing themselves more and taking out things that stress the system, mm -hmm. um, I think there's more space that opens up for people then to start to make maybe different decisions about nutrition or how, you know, what they're consuming. And consuming is not just food. Consuming is media. Consuming is, you know, just the, goes across a whole spectrum of things. Um, so, and then stress also kind of works against our immunity um, when it's excessive and chronic. There's a little bit of stress is a good thing. That's a great point. And you know, the emotions also that play into it, right? So if you're telling people to slow down and kind of get into a good place when they're eating, they're gonna absorb more nutrients and it's going to be a better experience for their body. And I think that's important too. We think that um, a lot of times in our modern culture, we think that the, our goal is a certain emotion. And so we do everything else around us quickly so that we can get to that goal of being happy on Hanukkah or on Christmas or on uh, New Year's or, or whatever we're celebrating or a special occasion. But we forget that every day we have that opportunity to kind of get ourselves into a good place when we eat, right? And it's a good time for us as well. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Sean, you know, I wanted to know when you were talking about the different herbs and warming up, one came right to my mind. And I could be wrong, you might be, but I, I and when I just hear winter and herb, the very first one that comes to my mind is ginger, because it's my secret weapon to warm up anytime, all the time. And um, are you? Do you recommend ginger for people to stay warm in the winter? And what other herbs you know are, are out there for us? I absolutely recommend ginger. Um, I use it all the time myself, and in my tea blending for clients or customers. Um, so, I, well, I. I want to say I want to I want to note for you definitely the way that you want to think about it um, ginger is spicy it's warm it like when you eat it you feel the warmth of um, herbal medicine is based on taste uh, and that would I would I, I think I could say that applies to many different cultural understandings of herbalism as well, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine. There's always a taste component. That taste tells you what the herb will do. Mm -hmm. So one of the herbs that I, or one of the types of herbs that I do typically recommend would be what, what I would call an aromatic herb or a spice herb. And a lot of these are herbs that you can find in your, med uh, in your spice cabinet. Uh, for mm -hmm. cooking. So it's one of my favorite ones. I also use, I have a whole list here, so I'm just going to read them off to you real quick. Uh, um, I have cinnamon and ginger. Those are probably my most to use. Um, and very, very warm help uh, distribute blood throughout the body, help boost the circulation. I 
use cardamom, black pepper, clove, lime, oregano, rosemary, turmeric, alliums. So those would be your garlics and onions. Um, and then there's a lot of other great aromatic herbs that also have that quality, uh, like coniferous trees, pine or spruce needles, cedar or juniper leaves. Use. Uh, there's a an herbically ash that has aromatic quality to it. So it's kind of similar to like a Sichuan pepper um, mm -hmm. in the way that it works, or it has like a tingly kind of feeling when you when you taste it. So those are that are going to help you, especially if you're one of those people that has like a cold and cold hands and feet quite often. Um, if you have cold hands and feet you need to boost your circulation. And it's kind of a good indicator that you are too cold, like uh, not just externally, but also internally. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one of my different types of herbs that I would recommend for immune health. Um, the other thing that I do wanna bring up about aromatic herbs before I seed my time here <laughs> um, <laughs> is I personally really love working with these things as steams or potpourris. Um, so yeah, often um, in the winter time, especially when it's dry, it's cold, I will take cinnamon sticks, citrus peels, clove buds, uh, star anise I have in my cabinet or my uh, refrigerator and just boil it on the stove or simmer it and let the steam kind of wash through the house if I if I can manage it. Um, there's a lot of evidence showing that those essential oils, the volatile oils that are released in that steam could have antimicrobial effects on the air, um, things indirectly through the steam if you yourself are starting to feel sick and it could help. That's fascinating. And you know, it it's, makes the house smell wonderful. So it's exactly. in a cell, right? Because worst case scenario, your house is going to smell great. But I love the idea of these potpourris and the tisans that you're blending for people. These are all things that are that are synonymous with the comforts of winter. People can do them in their own home. I have to throw in there that the good smell is the medicine. That's what that's that is what you're smelling is those volatile oils. So. Mm -hmm. Not only do you get the benefit of having, you know, immune health or whatever, but you also get a nice smelling house, and that's nice too. <laughs> it is wonderful, and you know, nature is—it's—it's uh, it's so simple when we let it be, right? It kind of tells us, like, you know, come towards this thing that's a wonderful smell, and stay away from these things that that are this way. And it, and if we let it be that. It's wonderful. Sean, talk to us a little bit about um, kind of like dosages and how much you need. I know that we can't diagnose anybody online, but one of the questions that comes to my mind is how much do I know if it's enough? Like um, you're blending tea, tea, certain tisans for people. So I'm thinking that those are going to be, um, they have a certain usage and you're probably using very potent, very good quality spices. Some people might be using things that they have in their, in their you know, cabinet and our, our uh, culinary things that come to your mind, because all this, many of the spices you mentioned are ones that we're using now for the winter and for holiday season and things like that. How much, you know, if someone just is generally a little bit cold at home and they, and they want to warm up and they're, they're using ginger or cheese and ginger and cinnamon, which are also great anti-inflammatories, right? How, um, how often would you recommend they do that and how much? Uh, uh, like you said, it's going to depend on the person. Uh, what I like to say is with aromatics, you're typically not using gigantic doses of them um, or using, well, it, it, you know, if you're using like a formula, like a tea blend, it'll be like a smaller part of the tea blend. Um, it's, I usually frame it for my customers as what flavor profile you're looking for. Do you want ginger? You want cinnamon? You want cardamom? You want orange peel, you know? Um, so typically I just frame it as like taste for people. Let me throw in a little flavor in your tea. Um, typically you don't need a whole lot of volatile rich, oil, uh, sorry, volatile oil rich herbs. Um, too much upsetting. A small amount of them is great to harmonize digestion. A lot of them have good benefits for the nervous system 
And if you think about volatile oils as like an element, sometimes they would be attributed almost to like air because they release into the air so easily. And so our system that manages air is our lungs and our respiratory system. So um, working with those just in the appropriate dosages or in the appropriate ways, depending on what you're dealing with, I think is important. It's so fascinating. Everyone, we're talking to Sean Rose, and he's a teaching assistant at MUIH, the Maryland University of Integrated Health. Sean, I have to I have to say it because you mentioned one of my one of my key words right now. My ears always perk up when I hear the word respiratory health. So, um, what are some of the the things that you're using for that right now? So, in addition to the aromatics through the steams and the you know just putting them in teas and everything, I also use a number of other herbs. Um, you definitely want to think about with your those are probably like one of the best things that you can eat this time of year and spicing your food. We already had that conversation. Um, and there is a reason, by the way, that we kind of go toward these things at this time of year and in our holiday cooking. Uh, I think we just kind of naturally go for it. Um, secondly, what I would be looking for is that um, our polysaccharide Saccharide rich, which typically, like, um, if when they get wet, they create what's called a mucilage or like a thick kind of texture to the water. Um, so you can think of like when you do oatmeal or when you do when you make uh, like flaxseed tea. Um, these these things really thicken up the water. Um, um, and what that is is that's mucilage. You you can eat it um, and what that does is it helps us in the body there's a lot of people that maybe mucus is just terrible and if you have too much mucus in your body sure it, it could be a very terrible thing but you also there there's a such thing as a correct amount of of mucus in your body and there's also a correct amount of inflammation so you want to manage that rather than completely take it away. Wow. So the mucilage helps stir the mucous membrane. That is your protective layer for uh, the way that we phrase it is everything internally that touches the outside world. So if you think about your digestive tract, your respiratory tract, your urinary tract, anything that has input coming in um, uh, is lined with these mucous membranes. So keeping those mucous membranes healthy is one of the major tasks that are so dry. So you can think of things like um, mullen is a great herb that's slightly demulcent, has a slight mucilage content. Marshmallow is a great plant. Um, I use cinnamon also. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will say cinnamon a thousand times because it's one of my favorite herbs. Um, that's a great, a great one. Mucous membrane, rose and hip. Um, calendula is immune boosting, has these poly polysaccharides in it as well. Um, although it doesn't create like a, a super thick mucilage, it still has those immune supportive properties. Um, and I'm just going to kind of quickly go over two other categories of herbs. Um, someone had mentioned earlier, I believe it was Cheryl, about the stress of the season, um, mm -hmm. slowing down is really important in winter. We kind of reason that the trees go dormant and the bears hibernate and um, it's just there's not much there's literally not much energy in the air for us to <laughs> you know use. So mm -hmm. this is just a natural time to slow down um, mm -hmm. and one of the ways to you sort of support yourself through that and that come from people needing things on a deadline or whatever would be supporting yourself with adaptogens. A lot of those are immunomodulators, things that help the immune system boost if it's underactive or help to calm, calm an overactive immune system. Um, might be like holy basil, go to cola, shisandra, ashwagandha, a lot of mushrooms like cordyceps. And then the last mm -hmm. category that I kind of want to mention 
would be herbs that are nutritive. They're high in flavonoid content and mineral salts and uh, other good, um, like even macronutrients possibly. So a lot of these herbs help um, just with your body's processes because what you're doing is you're literally fueling your body with the things that it needs to work. So one of the best examples I can think of, for instance, is something like pumpkin seeds, which are a natural source. Everyone knows you get your zinc and elderberry lozenges, you know, when it's uh, respiratory illness season. Um, so that's one idea, red clover. And then the flavonoid rich herbs that I like would be things like elderberry. That's a very popular one. Hawthornberry, which is heart protective, but also just a great source of flavonoids. Citrus peel, rose hip, uh, both of those last two have vitamin C content. So diversity um, of, uh, of different constituents um, to really support good health in the wintertime. Sean, this is wonderful stuff. Thank you so much. I'm really inspired and I'm sure everybody else watching us is too. Thank you all for your great comments. Um, Sarah Jean, you know, what are some of the Ayurvedic indicators or kind of clues that we can be aware of if we might have start having some symptoms or we might feel like our immunity is at risk and, and how can we put them to use? Absolutely. Great question. And I just wanted to give Sean a cheers as I drink my adaptogenic Tulsi tea. <laughs> Ayurveda has a very strong herbology practice as well. And adaptogens are just so key this time of year. Tulsi and ashwagandha all day, every day <laughs> for me. So some signs that your immunity might be lowering in Ayurveda from the Ayurvedic perspective would be fatigue, lethargy, a lack of a luminosity. Essentially, you'd look at your face and it would just like not be as shiny as it usually is. You're getting sick often. Um, you have less passion for the things that you used to want to do. Your digestion, which we use the word Agni in Ayurveda, Agni basically means digestive fire. And boosting and supporting your digestive fire is the key practice to staying healthy in the winter. So your Agni could be presenting as what we call Manda Agni, Tikshna Agni, or Vishmana Agni. Which would be Vishma Agni is essentially um, like IBS. It'd be like constipation into diarrhea, into hungry, into not hungry, just all sorts of toggling all over the place. Manda Agni is slow digestion, so very slow, not really hungry when you wake up in the morning. Maybe you don't eat until lunch and then it sits there like a rock. You don't have a bowel movement sometimes till later in the day. Sometimes you skip a day. It's harder to, to pass the bowel movement. It's slow, it's sticky. <coughs> That kind of thing. And then tikshnagni, which would be a very fast digestion. So you're just eating the food and it's going right through you. It's hot. Um, food is coming out whole. Uh, you kind of can't even keep weight on because you're eating so much. Those are the three imbalances of agni that we would look at that would be leading to lowered ojas or immunity in Ayurveda. And the reason, let me just share the reason that your ojas or your immunity and luster gets depleted. Uh, due to indigestion or poor digestion is because immunity from the Ayurvedic perspective is the last thing to get nourished after mm -hmm. all of the issues in your body. So you have to nourish rasa, rakta, mamsa, ashli, meda, uh, maja, chuka, artava. So all of those are the seven tissues recognized in Ayurveda down to the sexual reproductive tissues. And after that, you produce your immunity. So you mm -hmm. see your digestion is out of balance, which it can be, if you're not living in tune with nature, in tune with the qualities by treating and eating with opposites, then you'll be depleting your ojas and feeling those fatigues, those, those sad, slow, kind of energetic lulls during your day. And you'll know that it's time to balance out that, that digestive fire and start to, to regain your immunity. That's really important to know. Everybody, we're talking with Sarah Jean Rudman. She's adjunct faculty in Ayurvedic Wellness, Integrative Health Studies, and Nutrition at MUIH. And I have another question for you, Sarah Jean, but I just wanted to read uh, this comment that we have um, from somebody named Nikki um, Pittman. Nikki writes, my family moved to a new state from an urban city to a rural, rural environment in August and have been sick more than not since we moved. I'm supplementing with all the usual immune boosters vitamin uh, D3 slash K2 
C, daily multivitamin, quercetin, zinc, um, my, my, I might even pronouncing this wrong, I apologize, my talking mushrooms and turmeric, I add in mullein, fever, few, Gilroy, um, Garbanti, turkey tail, reishi, ginger, oregano, oil, cat's claw, a whole lot of other things. Um, tea, when symptoms are active, we are also taking local honey. We got it. We go. We get. We get outside every day. Spend at least a few minutes barefoot, and have started cold water immersion therapy in our creek, uh, three to five times a week. We're also practicing mindfulness. Uh, any suggestions on what else we can do? It is getting uh, used to. Is it just getting used to local strains of viruses and bacteria? I'm gonna. Since we're already talking, Sarah Jean, I'm gonna ask you to answer this one. Um, I know that you were already drinking uh, two different things when we started talking and that Nikki um, seems like she has a pretty good take on herbs, but I, I'm wondering there might be some specific um, Ayurvedic things that you could recommend. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll start by saying you're not alone, that right now the nation is in a basically a triple-demic. Um, so there are just more viruses this year than ever, so try not to put too much pressure on yourself to be as immune or feel as well as you did before you're doing fine, you're doing all the right things. The second thing is that moving to a new area is tumultuous to all of the energies. And as Cheryl said, we take in not only the food that we eat, but the things that we see and the things that we feel and smell and taste and hear. And in Ayurveda, everything that comes in through the five senses is food. You just went through a big move that shook everything up. Things are changed, they're unstable, even if they're stable because it's new. And so you're just in a new environment, you're in a new energy, and it's going to take a little while to balance. So I'll second my first statement, which is to give take the pressure off yourself. You're doing great and it's going to be okay. Some other things that you can do to support your immunity from the Ayurvedic perspective would be sense cleansing. This is one of the biggest things that we do every single morning. So wake up in the morning early around when the sun is coming up, immediately drink about 20 ounces of lukewarm water. Um, you could squeeze a little lemon in it, but not if you're having any kind of erosion of your tooth enamel or if you're dealing with any kind of GERD symptoms or um, anything else that's causing stomach upset. So just be mindful, omit the lemon if not, if not, enjoy the lemon, maybe even a little pinch of salt for extra hydration. From there, it's important to try to empty your bowels if you can, first thing. We don't want to carry the weight of yesterday into today, but if you can't do that, that's okay. You'll do that in a little while. The next thing you would want to do is take a tongue scraper. I should have brought one up from downstairs. Um, my son started tongue scraping with me when he was two, so this is good for any age. And if you don't have a tongue scraper, you can just use a metal spoon. The tongue scraper is going to be like a little, Banyan Botanical sells a great one. It's very cheap. You can even buy it on Amazon or on their website. It's just like a little upside down you metal thing. You hold it by the handles, stick your tongue way out, scrape down and back, getting all that white stuff, which we call AMA, or toxic buildup off of your tongue first thing in the morning. Rinse it, put it away. The next thing you'll want to do is get a good quality rose water. Um, okay, so don't try to make your own. I'm sure Sean could echo that there are a lot of kind of, um, when you're making things with herbs, like a, I've had colleagues make a trifle ghee and put it in their eyes and it wasn't strained enough. So just be careful if you're making your own rose water. I would buy something clinically created by an herbalist. Spray it in your eyes each time to clear out the eyes. Take some sesame oil, pure sesame oil, and do nausea, which is a nasal oiling. So put a little oil in each nose. Now, if you are not a very dry person, if you're not very, very dry, um, and you're not dealing with uh, serious nasal blockage, before you do the oiling, use your neti pot. So that's some saline water in your neti pot. Pour it through one side, let it come out the nose. Pour it through the other side, let it come out the nose. Blow your nose, and then take your pure, don't use toasted sesame oil because you'll be smelling like stir fry all day. Pure organic sesame oil or um, made nasi oil. Again, I love Banyan Botanicals. I also love the Mapi um, Maharishi Ayurvedic nasi oil. And put a little in each nostril. Just do a little circle in each nostril. From there, you're going to want to take a little bit of that pure sesame oil and put some in each ear, right? Because what are we doing? We're lubricating the channels so that we can hear appropriately. So a little bit of that sesame oil in each ear. And then take your organic, natural, pure, not toasted, I'll say again, sesame oil, and do what we call apyanga. Apyanga is just a self-oil massage. And you'll want to take a little bit of this warmed oil 
and put it on your long bones with long strokes, on your joints with circular strokes. Make sure you get each finger, each toe, go along your face, massaging the lymph nodes behind your ears and your neck, okay? You can even do some on the top of your head, especially if you deal with a lot of anxiety or insomnia. And then from there, you would want to get into the shower and rinse that off. Okay, you rinse that off. You don't need to use soap, you can use soap. If you're going to be doing physical activity that's going to be causing you to sweat and you want to wait to do your avianga until after that, that's fine too. But all of these are going to help boost your immunity. And the reason the oil massage is so important is because I want you to start to look at your skin as the first layer of protection against everything in the outside world. This is going to protect you from exogenous toxins, right? If we get a cut, and it doesn't seal up, well, what can happen? All sorts of, all sorts of cooties, I have a four-year-old, <laughs> all sorts of cooties from the outside world can get in there and create an infection. And if our skin is dry, it's more apt to break. The one other really profound thing that this warm oil massage can do for you is create a sense of self-love and groundedness. You'll be amazed when you start to massage your own legs and you get to an area like behind your kneecaps and you'll think, wow, I don't think I've touched there ever, you know, <laughs> barring maybe running some bubbly soap by it in my quick morning shower. So this is another moment to stop, slow down, say to the nervous system, everything's going to be okay today. Um, I'm here for you. I'm here to protect you. And the word for oil in Sanskrit is sneha, and that also means love. So that's kind of beautiful thing as well. So cleansing the five senses is a great way you can add to your practice of all the wonderful herbs you're doing, of the earthing that you're doing. The cold water therapy is good as well, though I will offer just a little bit of insight with that during this season. Um, what can happen when you do, for example, um, go into like a cold shower, like the Wim Hof method and sitting outside, is you get a really big boost of stress hormones of epinephrine, norepinephrine. And that can create a lot of like hypermetabolic stuff going on in your body, um, which can lead to more stress. If you're already in a stress state, adding that kind of stressful shock to the system might not be appropriate. Maybe wait and try that a little bit later, like in July or something when it's warm out and you've, um, you've calmed your nervous system down because that's going to disturb what we would call vata dosha, which is air and ether, which as I mentioned in the opening is what's predominating right now in the season in the world that we live in. So cleansing the five senses and using, I love the Banyan Botanical brands and the Moppy brand um, oils are great. And I will add too that if you work with an Ayurvedic practitioner, you'll be able to work on getting some of the medicated oils appropriate for your constitution or your doshic makeup, which is your balance of vata, pitta, and kapha, the three constitutional humors that make up everything and everyone. We all have a very individual balance of those. And when you learn what that is for you, you can cater your diet, your lifestyle, your oils, your herbs, your daily practices and routines to your constitution and be even more in balance with nature. Sarah Jean, this is just amazing. I appreciate so much everything that you've shared with us, the tips, the strategies, even incorporating your four-year-old's verbiage because it helps to break down some of these really complex concepts and make them all understand, but it's, it's just a whole new world of knowledge for many people I'm sure watching. So thank you very much. Um, that, those few words in and of themselves, I think would have, would have um, given us a lot of bang for our buck today, but um, this is very appreciated. And, you know, Cheryl, so many um, diseases and, and illnesses are caused by poor nutrition. But then again, you know, changing what we eat, even adding in some wonderful nutrients to our current diet can have a very fast and direct, um, you know, uh, effect on our immunity and things like that. So what are, um, you know, talk to specifically about nutrition boosting immunity. That's a great question. So nutrition does play a key role in supporting our immune system. And I'll speak briefly about some of the, the superstars in that area. Um, both Sean and Sarah Jean talked about the importance of the skin and um, also the mucosal layer, which again, people tend to think of as kind of on the U scale, but that that is a defense layer. So vitamin A plays a really important role in maintaining the integrity of surfaces, which is our really our first line of defense. And that does include our mucosal linings. 
Um, it also is really important for repair and it stimulates a number of immune responses, including antibodies. Mm -hmm. Carotenes, also really important, and they can convert to vitamin A, and then they additionally act as antioxidants. Uh, vitamin C is another really important nutrient. Um, it has antiviral and antibacterial properties. Um, it increases our resistance to infection, and, and, um, and it's also immunostimulatory. So it kind of ups ups the immune response. There was a question about having an overactive immune system and, and balance is important. And there are times when we want the immune system to be mm -hmm. a little bit more, um, I'm not sure aggressive is the word I want to use, but a little bit more active. Um, and then, but we want it to stand down when it's time to stand down and not stay in this kind of um, attack mode, if you will. Sure. Um, vitamin D is such a, um, popular uh, vitamin at the moment. Um, it's a very important player in immune function. It reduces the production of inflammatory cytokines, and those are small proteins involved in signaling. Um, and again, they have a they have a, an appropriate role, but you don't want them to kind of um, get out of balance and keep, keep on the attack when it's really time to just kind of settle back down. Uh, vitamin D also increases the function of macrophages. And I think of macrophages as kind of like the shop facts of the immune system or the Pac-Man of the immune system, gobbling up things that are um, don't really belong inside of us. Um, and then it also stimulates um, antimicrobial um, molecules. Iron, adequate amounts of iron are needed for the function of many components of the immune system. Um, zinc, that's come up in today's conversation that supports both the innate immune system, what we're born with, and our adaptive immune system, which is what we kind of develop as we're exposed to the world. Mm -hmm. It can suppress the virus's ability to attach to our cells and to replicate. And so if I'm feeling the slightest bit of um, a cold coming on or something like that, that is one thing I'll reach for. Um, I will say my, I am very sensitive to zinc. So I say to take it with food because um, mm -hmm. it, it can make you feel kind of nauseous if it's just hitting an empty stomach. And zinc also protects against free radicals, um, acts synergistically with vitamin A, and again, it inhibits the growth of some viruses. And then the last one um, is selenium, which is essentially effect, um, essential for all parts of the immune system. So if you search for kind of a foods rich and fill in the blank, Sure. Um, you'll find some really lovely options. Yes. What are five foods that you think that people should be adding in just in general, if they can eat them, if they're not allergic to them? To right, them? right. Thank you for mentioning that. Because I, I also wanted to say that um, it's hard to overdo any of those previous nutrients through food. It's not impossible. Um, but, you know, if you're making significant changes to your diet, you're going to want to work with a nutritionist or run it by a healthcare professional. Um, you know, I think food first is great because there's synergies that we don't even know about yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for the five foods, this is a really tough question because I have so many favorites um, and variety is important. Um, I would suggest focusing on foods that are in season. Mm -hmm. um, where I live, it's currently fall and winter. And then trying to eat whole foods across the spectrum of the rainbow. So some foods to consider, and uh, Sean brought this up, onions and garlic. Um, and I'm going to pretend I can't count to five. Um, leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables. So your kales, collards, spinach, chard, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage, dark orange foods like sweet potatoes, butternut squash, carrots, and pumpkin. The apple a day keeps the doctor away. Foods rich in vitamin C. So lemons, limes, grapefruit, kiwi, oranges, cranberries. Again, looking for things that are in season. Um, and another favorite of mine, um, and I know I'm past five, <laughs> is beets, both the, the root and the greens, and then nuts and seeds. Um, I just feel like that's giving you such a broad um, spectrum of the nutrients that, we, that I just mentioned that support the immune system. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Those are great tips that we've just heard from Cheryl Van Lair. She's faculty in the Department of Nutrition at MUIH. And MUIH also has a wonderful recipe resource on the website. So I'm going to throw that out there if anybody's 
looking for how to incorporate these ingredients that are approved by the university. There's some wonderful uh, sources there as well. And so I'd like to come back to Sean now. Um, you mentioned a key word that I just learned like two years ago, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but hey, probably there are other people that are just learning it too. So you talked about adaptogens. Sean, tell us a little bit more about how we can incorporate those into our lifestyle. When you said that I said one word, I knew it was adaptogen. So uh, it's a it's a big buzzword these days. Um, adaptogens, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, I'm told that scientists don't really like them. This is kind of where that immunomodulating property comes in um, because they, they do certain things for certain people and other things for other people generally. Oh generally an adaptogen is going to help your body with its stress response now it's always important when you're using them especially clinically that you're not using them as a band-aid to be used to just keep going at the same rate that you've been going because typically when you're stressed you know that's what we're doing we're just in the cycle or, or pattern of it so adaptogens um Basically, this is axes of the body, so like the hypothalamus pituitary uh, adrenal axis, also known as the HPA axis. These are like um, hormonal or uh, in organs, and what they do, uh, what the adaptogens will do is kind of regulate that flow of, uh, it's kind of like a cascade, like a waterfall of uh, uh, hormones, um, and other sort of constituents. Effectively, the way that I like to explain it is that most of the time it will just help you regulate your cortisol balance, cortisol being the infamous stress chemical that makes everyone gain weight and uh, you know everyone be, feel wild. You actually also need it to wake up in the morning. So there is a, uh, also a good amount of cortisol to have and adaptogens will mostly kind of help with that, but they also do a number of other things. Um, mostly because as your body deals with stress better, it can then, at least in my view, it can then sort of devote resources to other things that it needs to or sleep. Yeah, these things that are definitely affected by stress. That's great. And you know, Sean, I wondered, how did you get started in, in this field? What was it about herbal medicine? I know it's uh, a huge question. We need more question. Medicine. What sparked your interest? So for me, I've always, I, I'm, I'm a Appalachian boy. I'm from West Virginia, first and foremost. Um, so I'm from down near the river, you know. I've mm -hmm. been interacting with herbs and my family has been interacting with herbs um, for generations. There was kind of a, a point for me where I was a little bit separated from that. So my parents didn't really know much uh, about herbal medicine. My mom would use like, you know, tea tree oil and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to say that the herbs in some way, shape or form. Um, now I really got started in herbal medicine for my own mental health. Um, I'm a person with ADHD, uh, late diagnosis, much like I was only di diagnosed a year and a half ago. Um, so I grew up kind of thinking, what's wrong with me? <laughs> no, I don't fit in anywhere. Uh, you know, clearly there's something wrong. So I thought I had depression. I thought I had anxiety. Really, I just had ADHD. <laughs> um, so, I, I use my herbs mostly for my own mental health, but um, for my age, uh, herbal learning I've done, um, I can support a wide range of health conditions, both for myself and for other people. And mm -hmm. uh, being someone with ADHD, I think um, probably other people in, in this may understand what I mean here where I've, when I say that I've bounced around from many different types of work, uh, mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've worked in call centers, I've done 
I thought I was going to be an English teacher abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought I was going to be a court transcript proofreader. You know, the only thing that has ever stuck and completely maintained focus for me in my brain is herbs. <laughs> These days, I kind of refer to it as the only thing I can do. <laughs> Well, sometimes there's a reason for that too. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. That's, that's it's the only thing that makes sense these days. <laughs> and I love your well, number one, your honesty, but also how you talked about mental health because health is health, you know, and it really doesn't matter whether it's spiritual health or mental health or physical health because they're all going to affect the other at one point, whether people realize it or not. So it's and such an important discernment. That was a really big thing that I had to learn. Um, and something that I teach today when I go to give a class um, on herbal mental health, I always bring up your mind is generated by your body. And that means the whole body, not just the brain. A lot of us think it's all just up there, but your whole body is in communication with your mind at all times. And it is, a, in my eyes, it's a construct generated by it, but also in constant two-way communication. So what happens up here happens down here, and what happens down here happens up here. Mm -hmm. And it's through a combination of attendance, not just to the body or to the brain, but to both, that really will help you um, just create more stability for yourself in both your physical and mental health. And it's about just like, just like I said earlier, it's about having flow of mm -hmm. fluid in the body, but kind of what you're doing in mental health is also promoting fluid movement through life, not letting yourself get blocked by things, um, finding, you know, always staying in a mindset to pivot when, when something gets uh, moving like water is, is how I like to, to do things. Um, and I work a lot with therapists uh, I have a lot of therapists referral, like a big referral network of them. And I do a lot of um, work with acceptance and commitment therapy inspired because I'm not a mental health counselor, acceptance and commitment therapy inspired things. So that's kind of what I do. And um, yeah. And I appreciate you sharing it because everybody can use it. And I think the way that you described it was so eloquent and get to sync at the same time. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. What about you, Sarah Jean? How did you get into Ayurveda? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so I came in hot and heavy from the fitness world <laughs> and fell in love with yoga because I was just going at a pace that I couldn't keep up with anymore. Um, uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I, I too, Sean, I have ADHD. I was diagnosed as a child and continued through my life. And so it's interesting. I have also sort of jumped on the bandwagon of a hundred other careers. I was an audio engineer for live bands and all of these things. And Ayurveda is sort of the thing that always keeps my attention. Like the dopamine keeps going there. So I keep coming back to it. So at the end of my yoga teacher training, I learned about Ayurveda because it's the sister science to yoga. And I jumped right into an official practitioner training for that, became an Ayurvedic yoga specialist. And I even went to live in residence and became a School of Ayurveda intern, which was an amazing year of my life. And during that year, I decided that I wanted to be able to interface more with biomedicine. So that's when I took my um, master's uh, at Maryland University of Integrative Health in Integrative Nutrition and also in health and wellness coaching. Um, so, so that's how I found Ayurveda and, and went on to um, do my, my doctoral studies at University of Bridgeport in clinical education so that I could continue to share this uh, beautiful art and science. I love it because it takes into account the whole person approach, the beautiful idea of optimal health where we're promoting mm -hmm. people's assets, right? We're not looking at somebody and saying, Oh, well, your constitution is very fire and water, so you're going to have a lot of inflammation and a lot of this. It's, well, your constitution is fire and water, so you have a brilliance about you, and you have an energy about you, and you're able to get things done, and you're going to want to work at this pace, and here's how we keep that in balance so that it's luminous and it doesn't burn you out. So it has this very positive, salutogenic approach versus a pathogenic approach, and I just love that as well. So that's how I found Ayurveda. It's helped me balance my fitness athlete lifestyle 
and my, you know, sort of crazy go, go, go attitude with this self-care and self-nourishing that I get to share with other people. And that's just awesome. I love it too. It's just wonderful. I'm sure that everybody who gets to learn from you is equally impressed. So thank you so much for that. You know, we're almost running out of time here. So before I speak to Cheryl, I would just like to ask Sean and Sarah Jean if either of you have any um, recommendations for additional resources, um, go ahead and put them in the private chat and then they can put them um, in the public chat over on the side if you have any links or words or anything you'd like to share. I don't want to omit them from our discussion, but I do uh, want to move on and make sure that we get Cheryl's um, take on why she went into the field of nutrition. Um, so I'm kind of astounded it took me as long as it did to get into the field of nutrition because in my bookshelves behind me, I have one little shelf that is devoted to my prior career of IT program management. And I just couldn't see doing it for another couple of decades. I couldn't see doing it for another like month. Sure. Um, and then I had all the rest of the bookshelves, which now are going down the hall and up the stairs, are all around nutrition and wellness and communication and um, healing and all of that. And it's kind of like, oh, duh. Um, but I had a, a dear friend who was di um, diagnosed with type two diabetes and I helped him revamp his diet and the results were astounding. Um, then I did that with my father. And again, the results were just amazing. Um, and then I listened to phenomenal Dr. Liz Lipsky talk about epigenetics. I, love and when, I know. And when I got that glimpse of how food can affect how our genes express themselves, I was hooked. I had applied for the master's the next day. Um, I have not looked back since. I went right from the master's into the doctoral of, um, clinical nutrition program at MUIH, and I'm just mm -hmm. blessed to be able to be teaching at MUIH. Um, I get to learn something every single day, and as Sarah Jean said, getting to share that is just so exciting. Um, I love the science, geeky, nerdy part of it, and then also getting to work with individuals, helping them feel empowered, um, understanding that they, they do have a lot of control on about how they feel, but also being very kind to themselves too, because sometimes um, you just have to be kind to ourselves. I call that vitamin K like 12 or something like that. So um, yeah, so that's, that's how I got here. It was a very weird circuitous path, um, but I, I can't imagine not doing this. I tell people if I won the lottery, I would still do this. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. It's, it's just great to hear your story and to know how much you've done and how much you're helping others through that. So thank you. Um, we have a question from Alyssa. She asks us, what does it mean to have an overactive immune system? This will be the last question before we So I, th I think that that was, um, I think that that question originated from something that I had said about um, adaptogens being immunomodulators. Typically when I'm referring to an overactive immune system, I'm thinking of things like uh, autoimmune disorders where the immune system body, that's one expression of an overactive system. But I think, I believe Sarah Jean might have also brought it up, if I'm not mistaken, saying like, or maybe it was Cheryl, I don't know. Uh, somebody said uh, we kind of want the um, the immune system to die to like, I think it was Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, after you're sick, we want it to, we want the, the immune system to say, okay, our job's done. And if it's not doing that, if you're, if you have a prolonged illness, prolonged sickness, um, prolonged symptoms of sickness, that might possibly be an indicator. Um, or if you have lots of inflammation and pain in your body, that might be an indicator. But there's lots. I really think you need to talk to um, talk to a professional to to really make that determination. That's a good point. Thank you so much for answering that, Sean. I would thank you. We only have thirty seconds because this has been so enlightening and wonderful. What a great opportunity for me and for everybody who's watching to learn so much about how we can boost our immunity, stay healthy this winter, but also put either Veda and herbal medicine and nutrition to good use and perhaps even explore them in our own career choices and daily lives. So thank you all very much. 
And everybody, I urge you to go back if you didn't see the whole video to check it out on our YouTube channel on uh, muih.edu as well because they have a great amount of resources. Thank you all and have a wonderful winter season. Stay healthy. Bye-bye.